All right. Well, the title for today's message, uh, simply Genesis 6 or 9, was the flood local or global? <laughs> was the flood local or global? Or you might think regional or universal or however you want to categorize that. But that question that always comes up or that issue that's debated about the extent of this flood. And um, I want to deal with it just because it, it's, it always does come up. And... Um, I don't think it would be a service to us to pretend that it doesn't and just move on. Um, just by way of introduction, just kind of remind ourselves here for several weeks now, we've been uh, sort of tying up loose ends to this Genesis study so far, or at least in this section. Um, we considered the curse upon Ham and the blessing upon God at the end of chapter 9. We considered the words of God. Uh, initiating the death penalty for murder. We consider that for what period, I think, three different messages. So I want to turn now to this issue of the flood and whether it was a global catastrophe or a local catastrophe. I'm only going to spend one message on this. That's a commitment, just one. <laughs> um, so I don't intend, obviously, to get into all the various details of the debate uh, or to even really talk about all those details too much. My intention though, is not to sidestep the issue. Um, I'm more than happy, if any of you are curious, to provide you with a list of links to um, debates and videos and podcasts and articles, all about it. That's fine from all different sides. I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm not trying to, trying to shield you from diving into this if it interests you. But my point today, then, is simply to encourage you to see that there are genuine Christians on both sides of this issue, but also to equip you, I think maybe more importantly, with a certain list um, of necessary requirements for any interpretation. Like, I don't care what side you fall on, but whatever side, you've got to have to deal with these certain things and hold to them whatever position you come to. And so I think it's, that's a very important tool to have, is some certain absolutes as you enter into this discussion. Um, I also want to give you a few warnings about these sorts of debates and maybe just one main warning and uh, that'll come here in a little bit. Uh, so with that, let's just pray then and ask for the Lord's help in sorting these things out. We won't be too much in the text except to notice certain things as we, as we go through. Um, more or less, we'll just be talking about this issue and how we want to be uh, conducting ourselves as we deal with it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we are cast on you once again, uh, and we do that. Uh, we know we're in your hands, but more than that, as an act of will, we want to place ourselves there and trust ourselves to you and this time to you and ask you uh, to teach us uh, the things that are uh, fitting for us at this time with this topic. Uh, we want to honor you in everything. We want to thank your thoughts after you. We want uh, our minds to be slaves of Christ, and so help us in that, uh, to, to use our minds well, to hear and to listen as we should, be a thinking people uh, as you've equipped us to be. Thank you that you have become for us our wisdom. In the name of Christ, we pray, amen. Well, the first thing just to to mention is just kind of a cautionary statement, and that is I am mostly interested in this issue as it divides believers. That's kind of where I'm coming from today. Um, that is not to say that I'm uninterested or unaware that this issue of the Genesis flood comes up again and again in talking with non-Christians. Um, but rather um, than dealing with that, I'm simply dealing with those of us who believe God's Word and seek to take our stand upon it. In, in that group, there is a debate. You know, In the very least, I'm referring to a group of people who are all committed to the fact that every word of the Bible is true and who are seeking to follow Christ as disciples. So I'm not, I'm not throwing stones at anyone on the other side of this. I'm simply... But I am talking about only those people who are um, committed 
to the scriptures. So that means several things. So um, first, in a debate, uh, the first thing it means, uh, in a debate that often sees uh, one side decry the other side as compromisers who only want to make the Bible fit with the opinions of a lost mankind concerning these great and important matters of the faith, it means that we have to realize that every Christian in the debate has already taken up his cross to follow Christ. So that person on the other side who's disagreeing with your view isn't necessarily just a Bible compromiser or someone who doesn't, isn't concerned to uphold the truthfulness of the gospel. Rather, because we're talking now about Christians, not just anyone who holds that other, these other views, but Christians, we're talking about people who, are, who love deeply the Lord Jesus Christ and who have sacrificed much to follow Him. They've made an active choice to die to self and live to Christ. So it means we have all already agreed, before we begin the discussion, um, to bear the reproach of Christ in the world. And no one is seeking to adopt a view of the flood so that we don't have to bear the reproach of Christ. That, that's important. That we're talking about people who willingly sacrifice and suffer for the sake of Christ. And um, that matters where they stand. So we all stand apart from the world in our commitment to the gospel of God. Now, you can still be wrong about this issue. You can take a stance that does, in fact, greatly weaken your footing as a Christian. It can be unwise. It can be a mistake. It can be wrong-headed. It can be just wrong concerning the facts. You can wrongly compromise truths that will, in time, turn out to be the downfall of those who take your position. It may not be your downfall, but it may be those who listen to you. It may be their downfall. We see this historically again and again, right? Very often. Um, some issue comes up and it's debated among Christians and it's decided at the time that there are Christians on both sides of the debate. But a generation later, we see that those who took the one position as organizations, as groups, as individual believers and families have basically walked away from the faith. That happens. Now, I don't do that to sound the alarm, but it's to say that happens. That is something that can be at stake in an issue that can divide Christians. Um, it may sound to you like a slippery slope argument, and I don't know that it's not, but it doesn't mean that it's not a true argument or it's not a valid argument. It happens historically. We see it again and again. This may or this may not be that kind of an issue, and I'm not trying to say whether it is or not. It depends on maybe how you arrive at any given position that you take. Um, so, Again, uh, our generation is not going to be the only exception to this rule that these debates that happen among Christians, that's, that though they exist and both sides are Christians, that they, the ideas have, the positions they take have consequences for the next generation and even for themselves sometimes later down the road. That will prove, that will bear itself out in our generation as well. There are things that are debated among believers right now and that we find people kind of refereeing and saying, well, both sides are Christians. But what we'll find is in another 20 years, one of those positions was really wrong. And it's been proved to be wrong by its fruit. And uh, that matters. And it's important that we not forget that. So just because it's a debate that Christians have amongst themselves doesn't mean it's unimportant or it doesn't have consequences. However, it is quite a different thing to be a Christ-denying promoter of the world's lies than it is to be a Christ follower who happens to be mistaken on a number of issues. Those are two very different people, right? Someone who denies Christ and hates Him and denies the things that are true in the Scripture versus someone else who is a follower of Christ and is just mistaken on some points and hasn't understood rightly some things that are in the Scriptures. Very different. And you conduct yourselves very differently when you're dealing with those different groups. So that's the first thing generally I think it means. Uh, second, it means that we're not bringing into this debate about the flood all of the things associated with the creation-evolution debate. At least I'm not bringing them in here. I know that most of the time when we hear these, the, the flood debated, it is people who believe in an old earth and a local flood 
versus people who believe in a young earth and a global flood. And that's kind of the only two camps. But there are many shades in between. And um, there are people who are, uh, what you know, they, many who call themselves theistic evolutionists who claim to be Christians. As of yet, those people have not squared their position with many biblical doctrines, nor have they squared their position with the New Testament writers, nor do many of them even attempt to do so. They just flat out, you'll find even people who just a decade ago were, were uh, or maybe two decades ago now, were uh, heralded as uh, just kind of the cream of the crop among biblical scholars, now flat out saying like, well, Paul was just wrong. Jesus was just, he was a man of his time. They spoke according to their understanding, but we have far better understanding now. They're just mistaken. That can't be acceptable language for us as believers. And so, you know, we're not talking about, we're not bringing evolutionary, the creation evolution debate into this text. So I'm talking about people who, who are believers, period, and who believe in, his, in a historical Adam and who have this, discussion amongst themselves in-house, committed to Christ, and we're saying, what was the scope of this flood? Um, and that's the third thing I really want to just to bring out and to cause us to remember that in this debate, at least as I framed it, we're sitting at a table with fellow believers simply asking about the geographical extent of the great flood of Genesis. And that's it. That's all that's on the table. We're asking, what was the geographical extent of this flood? Surely there is a place among believers to at least have this discussion and lay it on the table and hear the different concerns some people are having. Love for one another, I think. If, I mean, if we're followers of Christ and your brother or sister in the Lord has a concern or a question or they're confused about this, don't we owe it to them? to have the discussion, to talk about it, to bring the issues out and say, well, what are your questions? What are the things you're finding difficult? Love for one another demands that we hear one another, that we seek to understand one another, and finally, to help one another to find and stand on what is true. So this is what I'm hoping to, to maybe equip you to do some in this. So first of all, just to lay out the two sides just very briefly of this debate. Again, there are... There are uh, it's not, these are the two dominant positions, but there are shades of them, right, from one to the other. It's on a scale, somewhat, but there are two main camps and positions. Uh, the two primary sides to this debate among Christians. The first we're all very familiar with is the one which is nearly the universal opinion of Christians throughout history. It was a global flood. That Noah survived a flood which covered the globe, and which amounts to an unimaginable global catastrophe. There simply were no survivors outside of the animals on the ark and Noah's family. That's the first position. That seems really straightforward. Second, the other side of the debate. Looks around at the many and varied disciplines of learning which seek to use the scientific method. So you have, you know, geologists, they study rocks and they try to figure out, they try to use the scientific method to come to conclusions about what the rocks say. You have groups that study plant life, groups that study, you know, all sorts of different things, um, you know, human history and all, just all sorts of things. They try, to, they try to bring science to bear on it. They're seeking to find the truth. And this person is a believer, but they look around, they see all these different things coming at them, and they begin to get a little bit uncomfortable with the traditional biblical position. It just seems like it's it's attacked constantly by everything people, you know, you have an expert in this field and he says it's impossible. An expert in this field, he says it's impossible. And you line up the 60 different guys from 60 different fields and they all say it never could have happened. And it's not unreasonable to say, you know, to have doubts or to begin to waver and think, well, is this right? I don't know. I mean, what does the Bible really say? So this person is not denying the idea of a flood but are rather feeling the pressure of what feels like a mounting list of evidence that this flood did not in fact occur the way that many think that it did. And so they begin to ask themselves, and I would say as every believer should do in such a circumstance, you should ask yourself, you want to say, have I foolishly read the text wrongly? I mean, have I been a fool and, and not been careful in my reading? Am I sure and certain that 
that the Bible is making the claims that I think it is. Is my current understanding of the text as faithful and as careful as it should be? Is there perhaps another interpretation of things that would remain faithful to the Bible and then not be at odds with what we think we know about the world around us? Those are, I mean, don't you want to ask those questions? That seems pretty responsible and reasonable. And so we don't want to, to you know, harpoon somebody for asking these questions. Now again, so long as both sides are committed to the truthfulness of the Word of God and are not seeking to just make the Bible say something it doesn't, then we're in a good position for a discussion. As long as we remain Christians and submitted to the text, then nothing is going to be wrong in what we do. But there comes a word of warning. And I was just stunned at this. I mean, you kind of know this, you know, that in, in debates about certain doctrines, texts, different texts get abused, right? I mean, that just happens. I mean, a text that has some phrase in it that obviously in the context means one thing. Somebody just rips it out and says, oh, look, see, this, now in this debate, this means this. And they just abuse it. That happens in all these sorts of debates. It doesn't just have to be about the flood. But I've always just kind of, I, I always felt that way very strongly when it comes to uh, the flood and creation. And maybe you do as well. But I just would say I've listened to, uh, over the last couple of days, quite a few hours of debates. But before that, I've read lots of books and listened to debates and watched debates. And the ones I listened to the last few days were of the, uh, the most prominent names in both of these camps. And what I heard from both sides all the way through was the abuse of the Bible. Like it wasn't even close. It wasn't even an attempt to be faithful to the things that were said in the text. And that's heartbreaking in a way. That these are the men who are the, the kind of the pillars of their respective camps and it's like they've even, they're not even discussing the Bible. They're just arguing about their theories and just grabbing a text to, to say, well, see, this obviously means this. And we're just stacking inference on inference on inference, both sides. And so it's tragic. Many times the texts are ripped out of their context, made to carry weight and meaning they were never intended to or even just flatly manipulated, and it's obvious. Often what I find is the two sides are not even having a discussion, but rather merely pronouncing their own viewpoint to those who can hear them over the airwaves. Right? That's really what it's about. It's a, it's a, I'm going to make my case. So let's be very careful then not to create meanings in the text ourselves or to talk past one another in such a disrespectful and self-assertive way. It's not Christian for us to do that. I mean, it's... You might win the debate. You might be right, but you're wrong. Right? That's the problem. So the first thing, the first problem with this is it fails to submit to the Bible and to treat the Bible with reverence. So that's a huge problem. You don't treat the Bible with reverence. How can that be a Christian attitude? And the second thing is it fails to act in humility and gentleness and love with those we interact with. Also very much not Christian. So that's just the warning. It's just... You know, again, the discussion's healthy among believers, among those who are submitted to the text, and we're agreed we're just seeking to determine what does the text say, and what does the text allow us to believe, and what does it disallow us to believe. And that's what we wanna, where we want to land. If that's our position, it's a very healthy discussion. But we have to be careful not to manipulate the text. Now, let me give you... Uh, let me... You might be hearing this and think, okay, but still, why are we even having this discussion about a possible local flood? It's obvious it's global. And so what I want to do is just kind of, first of all, I'll tell you, my position is it is a global flood. So let me just put, clear that out of the way. I'm not trying to bring you over to some other side or something, if that's not your view. But it is, <laughs> I want you to see that it's not just an obviously open and shut case in that there is some room here to ask the question if the flood might have been local in extent or regional in extent. And I want to just show you that just from very briefly from a couple of scriptures. And I, we could do it at length, but I just want to do it briefly for the interest of time. Give you a sense of what's, what I'm talking about. Um, and I just want to talk about briefly about this, the, some of the language that's used. I mean, we have, you know, the, the global flood group always says, you know, you know, is... The, the flood 
rose and rose and rose, and it was 150 days. It was prevailed. How does that sound like a, like a local flood? And it rose up 15 cubits above the highest of the mountains, and all the mountains under the whole of heaven were covered, and all the animals were destroyed. This is universal. Well, all of that kind of language gets used in the Bible in ways that are not universal over and over again. In fact, most of the time, that the, that even that word like the, all the land, the whole earth, is used, but the vast majority of the time that that phrase is used, it doesn't refer to the whole globe. So that's a point that's made. See, it doesn't have to mean that. Well, yes, but again, context is king, right? So if you say more than half of them don't refer to the whole globe, like more than half of what you're claiming doesn't refer to the whole globe. More than half of those are clearly just a regional thing or a, a local thing or even just a town or a field. And it's obvious from the context. This is not so obvious from the context. Genesis 6 or 9 seemed to me to demand a, more of a global context. But nonetheless, in terms of the, you, the words used, all the earth, the whole earth, I'll just turn to two other places in Genesis where Moses uses this exact, uses this exact phrase in ways that clearly do not refer to the entire globe. The first one is Genesis 11. Verse 1, right? This is the, the Tower of Babel. You remember, remember just historically, what was the problem? What was, what was going on, let's say, at this Tower of Babel? Who was assembled there? Anyone? Who was assembled at the Tower of Babel? A couple, couple nations, or who was assembled there? Adam, you're looking at me. The whole, everybody. They were all assembled there, Right? Verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And this goes on. So... The people all had one language. They were all there together. They had come with some from the east. They traveled a little bit west into these plains, and they begun to build for themselves something. Now, the whole earth had one language. Now, we obviously know that we're not, in fact, here we're not even talking about the earth itself. We're actually talking about the people, all the people on the earth. That's all that's meant. The whole earth had one language. All the people on the earth had one language. And we know from this, they were all there together because it tells us later that later the Lord scattered them throughout the world. He told them to go and fill the world. They weren't. They were just kind of going on their own way all together. And God scattered them, each their own tongue. And they filled the earth in that way. That's how the nations filled the, filled the world. And so here, whole earth actually means all the people of the world, all of them, but actually in a pretty small space. Like it's not, we're not talking about the whole earth. We're not talking about other continents. We're not talking about even other regions. We're not talking about mountain ranges. We're talking about the plain of Shinar, the whole earth. There on the plain of Shinar was the whole earth. So that word is used that way. And it's just up to us to know that it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean it the way we think of it. Um, in that context. Or here's another one, Genesis chapter 41, very well-known and often used text in this connection. Genesis chapter 41 and verse 57. I'll start in verse 56. This is talking about the life of Joseph. Some of you kids, I told you I was going to get there. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> verse 56, so when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened so when the famine had spread over what? All the land. It's the same phrase. The whole earth. You could, I mean, if it's the same, we're going to say that the famine had spread over the whole earth. Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Verse 57, moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to, to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over the whole earth. 
It's, it's a regional famine. Like we just know that almost instinctively, a big region. But when the whole earth is coming, we're talking about the whole earth as it's known to the Egyptians, all the people that come to them. They come. I mean, we don't tend to think that, you know, the Inuits are traveling to Egypt. We just, I mean, we don't, ha it's not even in our mind. And so, this is what we mean. And it's obvious in that text. Um, phrases like, under the whole of heaven. You know, often used in Scripture to refer to, you know, you look out and under the whole of heaven, what do you see? Under the whole, I mean, under the whole sky, what are you able to see? It's not necessarily, the phrase doesn't mean, as we think of it, under all the sphere of heaven, under that, within it, all this is what was happening. It simply means, look out, and as far as the eye can see, under the whole of heaven, this is what it is. Um, we have this phrase, the mountains were covered, 15 cubits high. Um, could mean a lot of things. Um, could mean that the flood itself was only 15 cubits high and had, and had reached even up to the mountains and had covered them. That phrase covered, we think, well, covered like submerged totally. No, can this even mean overwhelmed? It could simply mean the mountains were so eroded and bogged down and waterlogged that not only were they just uh, unrecognizable in a sense, but also then they were even covered up to, to 15 cubits high at their base. They were, I mean, these things are overwhelmed and overrun with water. Now, I don't tend to view it that way. I just mean the language will bear that meaning. It's all that I mean. The language would bear that meaning. I don't even mean the context allows it. All I'm talking about is just the phrases themselves and the words. Now, if I hear that, then I think, okay, so let me just give you what I think is a pretty reasonable proposition. Suppose, and I'm not saying it can, but suppose it can be shown that the language used in Genesis, in the, in the Genesis flood account, could be local in its reference. And that that is maybe even the best understanding. Suppose you could, you could do that. That is, that it's not an, an absolute in its language of the globe. The scripture isn't absolute. Then is it, isn't it very reasonable to consider that if those who study the relevant scientific data if they could point to a local flood, a regional flood, that would in fact meet the biblical conditions, meet the biblical text requirements, wouldn't we, wouldn't we want to be open to the idea of putting the two together in a possible marriage and saying these match and fit? I mean, if the biblical language is open to it, and if I can come up with an interpretation of the scripture that's faithful to everything and that allows for a local flood, and if I see scientists who are all saying there was a local flood at that time, or at such and such a time, and it may be it, why not seek to match these up, at least tentatively, and say, well, maybe this is what the Bible was talking about. So before we get there, and because I don't plan to take us there, I guess, but let me just give you, as if that's, I mean, that seems imminent, I mean, just very reasonable a position to take. We're not, we're not saying at this point that the Bible allows that. We're simply saying if it does, if we can interpret it in such a way that it allows it, and if the scientists also point to something that seems to fit, then why not tentatively say this may be, in fact, what happened? So let me just give you then what I think are some necessary elements for a biblical understanding of the Genesis flood. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have eleven. Eleven of them. And we'll go through them quickly, but I have eleven of them. First of all, there must be a God wrought flood which was intended to deal with the wicked violence of mankind and all that man has ruined. We just gotta just say flat out we're talking about a miraculous thing or something that was, you know, wrought by God at this time. And the reason I mention that is because what, even the local flood, even if you just say, well, it was a local flood, that does not take the miraculous out of this thing. I mean, you still have Noah, even if you say it was a local flood with just the local animals, you've got an ark that's got to get a lot of animals on there, and you've got eight people who do have to do a massive amount of work if there's no miracle of any kind. You have all sorts of questions that you've that you've created for yourself that are not easily answered 
um, apart from God's involvement. So it's a God-wrought flood intended to deal with the wicked violence of mankind and all that he has ruined. It's miraculous. That's the first thing. Secondly, you have to deal with the building of the ark according to the prescription of God. God commanded Noah to build this ark according to a certain measurements in a certain way. And he had a reason for doing that. Um, many of these positions, they argue back and forth, well, then if it was just a local flood, then and Noah had 100 years. I mean, why didn't he just tell Moses or Noah to leave and, just, and get the animals to migrate? I mean, what is the problem? Why do this ship? Well, you're going to have to have some sort of an accounting for that. And I don't mean to say that a local flood can't account for it. I just mean you have to, it's going to have to have that accounted for. The building of the ark according to the prescription of God. Third, we have to have an affirmation of the biblical dates concerning the life of Noah. This one's huge, I think. You have to have an affirmation of the biblical dates concerning the life of Noah. How old was Noah when this thing started? Right? How long did he build this ark, or roughly? Um, how old was he when the flood started? How old was he when the flood ended? How old was he when he died? Those things matter because... Again, if, you're, if your intention is to hold to a local flood because you don't have to believe in a lot of the things that are hard to believe about the Bible, Noah's life is bound up right in this flood account. And his ages are incredible. And you're going to have to believe that. You're going to have to account for that. You can't dismiss it because you don't like it. And also says a lot about how long the flood was. Uh, you have to, fourthly, have a flood which leaves no human survivors but those mentioned on the ark. No human survivors but those mentioned on the ark. You, you're not allowed to say what, what many people say who hold to a local flood, that those humans who lived in the area were wiped out, but others on other places were not. Because the New Testament's very clear that all of us are descendants from Adam and then from that descendants from Noah. Only eight people survived the world that then was. And so you're, you're left with this. You have to believe it. And the, fl and the flood account it's, itself is extremely, extremely clear. Genesis 7, 4. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights. Every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the land. Then in chapter 8, verse 19, we'll read this verse again later too, but I'll start in verse 18. So Noah went out, his sons and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by families from the ark. Everything that moves on the earth went out. So that's a requirement. No human survivors but those mentioned on the ark. Fifth, you have to, you have to affirm a flood that leaves no animal survivors but those on the ark. With one caveat here. Perhaps, perhaps, I'm not convinced by this, but it's, it, it gives me pause. Perhaps it only refers to animals that mankind had had contact with. If you're going to say there was a local flood, you know, or did the penguins get on the ark? Well, if it's a local flood, the penguins don't have to be there. Or what, you know, and so that kind of thing. And man would have had no contact with them. And if you look in the Genesis account, why does God bring the flood upon the upon the earth because the wickedness of man's heart, he had ruined the earth, he'd brought corruption to all flesh, and God was going to destroy it all. If humanity had only extended out so far, God can wipe out all of humanity, and at the same time, He wipes out all the animals that they have corrupted, and that all in one local flood. It doesn't have to get global. The only thing I have that gives me pause there and difficulty is what I read in Genesis chapter 8, verse 19, that you know, every living thing and every bird and everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. It sounds, he didn't say all the, all, the, all the animals that went on the ark came off the ark, they all survived, but rather every living, Moses is telling you, every living thing that currently moves on the earth at all came off of that ark. 
And so that text gives me pause. I don't think I can get around that passage. But whatever it is, you have to at least believe that there was such a flood that no animal survivors uh, were around, at least to the extent of that flood. No animal survivors. But perhaps maybe only the animals that mankind had had contact with. That's a possible interpretation, but I, I don't know. Um, six. You've got to account for 40 days and 40 nights of heavy, heavy rain. 40 days and 40 nights of heavy rain. I don't know anywhere, and maybe, maybe there are places in recent history that have experienced that, but 40 days and 40 nights of heavy rain. Wow, that's a lot of rain. Um, you know, we think we've had you know, lots of rain when we have three or four days in a week where it's raining. We think, goodness, it's so wet outside. Will it ever quit raining? I mean, what do you do on night 39? I mean, it's unbelievable. 40 days and 40 nights of heavy rain. You've got to account for that. What else? Clearly, in the, so that's uh, chapter 7, verse 12. Let me just kind of tie these to text as we go. And rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. There we go. Next thing. A great amount of water must come from below. Verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So you have whatever it is, the fountains of the great deep burst forth. If your theory of a local flood is just this dam broke, and it rained a lot, that's not it. There's more. You've got to have some sort of a theory that says something about Whatever it means, the fountains of the great deep, whatever they are, for them to burst forth and send forth their water on the earth. A great amount of water has got to come from there because you may remember you have, and this is the next thing, 150 days of increasing and prevailing waters. But only 40 days of rain. So that leaves 110 days where the water's rising and prevailing and rising and prevailing for 110 days with no more rain. Where's the water coming from? From these fountains of the great deep. That's got to be factored in there. And I haven't seen any of the local flood theories that's done that. But it's got to be there. Then you have a gradual, somewhere between 150 and 200 day drying out period for the land until it's well dry. 150 to 200 days, that's about a long time. Not a rush of the waters back out to sea, nothing like that. That's not what we're talking about. It's a rush of waters somewhere, but it's not just dried out in the normal way. We get both of these last two points from chapter 8. What else do you got to have? Some explanation for the covenant sign of the rainbow. Some explanation for the covenant sign of the rainbow. Um, by which I don't mean an explanation for the creation of a rainbow as a new thing. I don't hold to that. Um, some people might hate that I hold that, but I just think God assigns significance to the rainbow. It says, when you see that now, I want you to think of this. This is my bow that I'm hung in the clouds. And that's my sign to you. Um, but you've got to have an explanation for it, meaning God said with that sign, I will never again flood the earth in such a way, right? I establish my, verse 11, chapter 9, verse 11, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Down at the end of verse 15, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. If you have a local flood, if your position is a local flood, oftentimes the global flood people will say, well, see, there's other local floods that destroy things. So that means God broke his promise, according to your view. No, the promise was, never again will I send a flood that will destroy all flesh and all humanity. And God's never done that since. 
If nothing else, God could send the exact same flood again if it was a local flood, and simply the faithfulness of God to have dispersed us throughout the world would mean that He would keep His promise still. So, but you have to have an accounting for that. You have to have, uh, your flood has to be of such a magnitude that it's not happened that way since. An explanation for this covenant sign of the rainbow. And then the last thing I think is a, is a minimum requirement is you have to have a geographical resting place for the ark in the mountains of Ararat. Right? You can't, if your local flood t- takes place in North America, wrong. Like it doesn't qualify. If it takes place, it's got to take place where a ship could rest on the mountains of Ararat. Not Mount Ararat necessarily, but the mountains of Ararat. That mountain region has to land there. So that limits you as well. Those, I think, are necessary elements for a biblical understanding of the Genesis flood. If we're going to say, you know, if we're looking at any phenomenon, we've got to be able to make it fit with at least those requirements from the Bible, whatever it is. So you can't even have a theory unless you've squared it with those things. It's not even on an option to believe. There are very few such options out there that have been proposed. A lot of people who have a local flood theory, but I mean, I don't know of any of them that meet those minimum requirements. And all those things are just non-negotiable in the way that the, new t- or the, the, uh, the account is laid out for us. These are We have to believe these things. It's there. There's no wiggle room on those. There might be some wiggle room about the language of the whole earth and all that. Maybe we can get to a local flood that way. But if you're asking me to adopt a position that denies these other clear statements in the Scripture, I can't get there. Because I'm a Christian, right? Because I'm submitted to the text. I can even want to get there. But I can't get there because I'm constrained by the text. So those are necessary elements for just a biblical understanding of the Genesis flood. But now let's talk about this. What are some necessary elements to have an alternative for the traditional understanding of the Genesis flood as global, meaning now it's, it's not global, it's local? If I'm going to adopt a position, if, I'm going to, if I have the traditional view now, what, is, what things are required, at least in my mind, to change my position to a local flood view. The first requirement is that I've got to at least have an affirmation of all these necessary biblical points. The first thing is it's got to jive with the Bible, number one. Number two, it has to have some clear scientific evidence. Right? If I'm going to adopt it in order to kind of be more comfortable in these other discussions, I've got, I'm going to do it because it has more scientific evidence. It has clear scientific evidence. So I'm not considering it unless it adopts all these biblical points. But once it does that, then the question is, does it have clear scientific evidence? Third, it cannot create for me more difficulty than the global flood model does. If, I ha- if believing this requires me to believe in more radical, miraculous things than the global flood does, then that's just kind of a quirky interpretation. That's, there's no reason to go against all of church history, and even before church, what we might consider church history proper, uh, even Old Testament saints, what they believe. There's no reason to go against that to adopt it. So it, it can't create a more difficult position for me. And the fourth thing, it must generally fit the biblical timeline. If we're talking about something that happened a million years ago, according to scientists, it probably doesn't fit, right? But I mean, go back and we figure, I mean, what's a range of time that we're talking about? Because, you know, scientists look back and they can look at all these different, uh, you know, in their idea, these geologists, when were these, this, this regional flood and that regional flood, and they have these wild various dates for these things. This one was in this region at this time, and then, 100,000 years before there was this other one, and then 5,000 years before that there was another one over here. Well, we're we're looking at a certain time frame. So we've got to limit ourselves to that as well. So that's just, I think those are minimum things. So let me just uh, remind you again, what are the, in my understanding, the, the minimum requirements for a biblical understanding of the Genesis flood? First of all, it's got to have a 
uh, account for a miraculous flood, a God-wrought flood meant to deal with the wicked violence of mankind and all that man has ruined. That's the first thing. Secondly, the building of an ark according to the prescription of God and a reason for it, a valid, a valid reason for the building of the ark. Thirdly, it has to affirm the biblical dates concerning the life of Noah. You can't just tell us, well, he wasn't that old. That's right into the biblical account of the flood. You've got to affirm his age and how long things lasted and all of that. Fourth, uh, the flood, you have, have a flood which leaves no human survivors but those mentioned on the ark. Period. That's a requirement. You can't have survivors outside the ark. Fifth, you've got to have a flood that leaves no animal survivors but those on the ark. Though I gave that caveat, perhaps this maybe just those animals that man has had interaction with. It's possible. Sixth, 40 days and 40 nights of heavy rain. Seventh, a great amount of water must come from below, the fountains of the great deep. Probably more water there than, the, than came from the sky. Um, because you have, and this is the eighth thing, 150 days of increasing and prevailing waters, but only 40 days of rain. So there's not, again, we're not talking about a broken, you know, land bridge or a dam somewhere that gave way. You know, we're not talking about a, a melting glacier lake. But it's, it's bigger than that. It's more involved than that. The fountains of the deep burst forth. That sounds miraculous. And unless they're willing to point to that, then they don't have it. Um, then you have, uh, ninth, a gradual 150 to 200 day drying out period for the land until it's well dry. That looks very different than a lot of the local flood models as well. Uh, tenth, um, an explanation of the covenant sign of the rainbow, that this would never happen again. God wouldn't do this again. So just some reasonable explanation for that. And then the last thing was a geographical resting place for the ark in the mountains of Ararat. You've got to have, it's got to fit that. It's got to be in that region. So those things are minimum requirements for evaluating these positions. And then again, if we're going to adopt it, then it's going to have to be, not only is it going to have to meet those requirements, but it's going to have to actually have some positive things going for it in terms of scientific evidence, right? It's going to have to be the right time. It's going to have to uh, be convincing uh, as, a, as, a, a, uh, as a flood event. And it can't create for us more difficulties than the global flood model does. So for all those reasons is why I still am... Uh, I'm willing to listen to those from the local flood position when they say they've got a theory or we well, haven't heard this, my latest understanding of the local flood theory, let me give it to you. I'm willing to listen because maybe they can show me that they've got a model that fits. If it does, I'm pretty willing to adopt it because I don't enjoy looking at pieces of scientific evidence and saying, I can't believe all of what they're saying. I want to believe that. I want to believe them. Um, but at the same time, I'm constrained by the text. And so for that reason, while I'm willing to hear, I'm, my, both feet are firmly planted over here in this global flood position because I have not seen anything which meets these minimum requirements. There are other things I would like them to be able to do. I mean, these things are required. There's other things I would like to be able to fit and have it fit a certain way. And it's like, oh, that text would really look, work well this way and that'd be neat if this, if, if this was the way it happened. Those are just you know, preferences, but we're talking about minimum requirements. If we're going to be faithful to the Bible and believe God's word, these things have to be there in any local flood view. And so that would just be, that's kind of what I do, right? I'm sitting down with a, somebody who's a believer and I say, well, I believe in a local flood. I'd sit them down and say, okay, since we're committed to the scripture, I just want you to show me point by point how you account for this and your understanding. And if you can account for them all, like I'll give you a, a very honest hearing and you may convince me. Um, at that point, once they've done those things, now I'm willing to listen to these other things and say, okay, well maybe I adopt the view. Um, I urge you all to take the same position, um, to hold to these things, because uh, they're clearly in the text. Um, so again, as I understand it, I have not come across any of the local flood theories that convince me of almost any of these points. Um, but I do very much like the way they deal with some of them. Like they, you know, they may, they may get me on three or four, and I think, well, that theory holds it. 
you know, that holds water on this one, this one, this one, and this one. And these six texts over here, it's got a great explanation for that. But look about these other three. It just ignores them totally. And that's a problem. I can't pick and choose. Are there questions or comments on this? That's, um, I, I've, I've done, I think, what I set out to do in the message today. Um, anyone have questions, comments, concerns, disagreements?